This is Something to Talk About, which is a uh, regular program here at the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, uh, often often on, usually online and sometimes also in person, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1.30. Uh, you can check out what's coming up by going to biseniorcenter.org slash calendar, and you can see upcoming uh, programs and events. And if you have a suggestion for something we might talk about, uh, send an, a note to info at biseniorcenter. Uh, dot org. And we are grateful for sponsorship from Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island, which has a memory care facility and are build, they are building assisted living and independent living up on Rolling Bay. Call 360-689-4314 to learn more. Today we have with us uh, Tim Dynan, who is with Cook Family Funeral Home. And uh, Tim, thank you very much for agreeing to talk with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, I was struck by a note, a little promotional piece that you had out on Facebook that caught my eye, uh, which was called The Worst Call of Your Life. And it gave some pretty straightforward, non-pressure uh, uh, responses or suggestions for responses that we might have when we have a loved one who is either ill or in hospice who... Um, uh, we learn has died, that we are, of course, at that point, kind of waiting and dreading that phone call that's going to tell us that. Um, but still, many of us, uh, and it's, I think, a pretty human thing, uh, put off thinking about exactly what our response is going to be. So I thought that was mm -hmm. a great little suggestion. It, it suggests the idea of basically stopping what you're doing. Don't move. Don't move too fast. To break, reduce noise, exhale, alert your family, talk to a funeral home, hydrate and eat. But basically, slow down. You know that you're going to be under a lot of stress. Absolutely. Just an incredible amount of stress. And it all comes at once because you're dealing with it on top of the emotional side. So now you're, you're, you're kind of in two battles within your own you know, your own being because you have this emotional connection and then you have the, the logical side of the mind that's saying, okay, we have to do this, 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 and this, and how do we proceed? And the whole time that that's happening, the emotional side is whirling around and taking you off base constantly. And as we were discussing before we started, um, I have seen some of the most decision capable people, uh, you know, you ask them a question and they, they always have a direct answer. Walk in here and they can't even answer a question. Uh, and it's because the emotional side's taken over. So yeah, the very first part of that is stop and slow down. Um, there is no set rule that you have to do anything at any specific time, other than consider your next steps for the loved one's care if you're involved directly in that. So what do I mean by that? Um, a lot of folks are on hospice. Wonderful organizations, the hospices in our area, we're very fortunate. Um, they do a, they do an amazing job. They they truly do. They 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 bring the family through it. They try to prepare you for what the inevitable will be, and then they provide that all important comfort care uh, to make sure that the person that is about to pass is not struggling to do so. Um, you know, and and when that happens. Normally, the hospice will ask you, who do you choose for your funeral provider? So that's already done. Um, so they'll make the call for you. We always encourage the family to do it, but uh, hospice will normally do it. What that does is it gives you an opportunity to just slow down, catch your breath a little bit. I, say, I use that term all the time with folks. Just take some time and catch your breath. Just process what's just happened. Yeah, one of the and things that I one of the things I I saw in that note was something about turning off the radio or get away from a computer. I mean, there are all these things that are always our lives are so full with distractions. And, oh, constantly. And constantly. this is it. And and when you're learning about someone close to you dying, um, you have a lot of distractions just inside your head, I guess. And so you should you do. take some time. Yeah, take some time. And, and you know, the one thing that people don't realize <clears throat> is 
they have this urgency to call or have hospice call the funeral home. And that's wonderful. Or, you know, we want you to do that. But the caveat to that is you don't have to have us rush right over. Uh, in today's world, a lot of folks are choosing to spend some time with their loved one at home. They, they, they want to have them there for a couple hours, maybe. Uh, maybe something happened at two, three o'clock in the morning and they just want that quiet time when the phones are quiet and there's, you know, you're not normally watching TV just to spend time with that person they've lost. And we do that quite often. We'll schedule that pickup time with families and they'll say, yeah, I need a couple hours just to, just to be with them. And that's important. Uh, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, you know, we were always designed and taught to, that phone rings, you go. And, you know, life's, we, we need to, to take that break and, and look at that. Turning off computers, phones, you know, your phone's important. I tell families all the time, you know what? There's no harm in turning off your phone and letting folks know you need some time to yourself. You'll call them back. And, and, and they all, you know, they're, they're, they're coming from a good place. They're good hearted folks. They want to help you. But sometimes it's overload and you need to say, look, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I need you to respect what I need right now. And that is just some time to, uh, you know, make this uh, real in my own mind. Uh, and the circumstances are just endless as to what may have happened. You know, older parents and things of that sort, you're, you're kind of, you, you know, you're kind of ready for that, even though that call is still hard. But you've come to grips with the fact they're not going to be here forever. Um, lose a sibling or worse yet a child, much different dynamic. So, uh, you know, or spouse that's close to you. you, you know, a lot of these folks are just so close with spouses and, uh, you know, that's, gosh, they spent a lifetime together. So it's, it's, you need that time just to come to grips with what's happened before you move on to the next step. So um, when you do hear from someone who is uh, dealing with the, the death of uh, someone close to them, what are the first questions that they're that they're asking you? You know, at the initial call, a lot of the time, it's just they want to know what the next steps are. And, and my, you know, my answer is typically that we need to, we're going to need to ultimately gather some information, but you need to think about what kind of care you want for your loved one. So, and what I mean by that is you wish to have a view. Do you want to have cremation versus burial versus green burial or one of the eco-friendly options that we offer. Um, discuss that with your family. Now's the time to discuss that. Um, is there something special you want your loved one to have with them when we come to your home to take them into our care? It could be as simple as a note or a flower. It could be a family photo. It may be a special favorite blanket. Those things are important to folks. Uh, maybe it's an article of clothing that they love, you know, they want to just have with them because they've had it for years and years. Um, whatever that special thing is, is important. Uh, and then we talk about, you know, what to expect in the arrangement. And I don't get too involved in that simply because it's too overwhelming at that point to do that. So the questions are simple and basic. And if the answer is we're not sure, then we have the ability to take steps necessary to hold someone for a specific period of time. Uh, so that I can say, and it's usually about 24 hours. So they have the time to make that choice. Um, maybe it's not as clear as people would like it to be because their family member wouldn't talk about it. So that's, that's a, not uncommon. Yeah, okay, that's the, so the obviously ideal to have a conversation in advance about what uh, what I or my loved one might want to have um, done with our body as after we die, and um, but sometimes some people don't want to talk about it, and so it's going to become. You're absolutely right. The other thing that's important too is to know where the important documents are: social security numbers, uh, and if the person's a veteran, where the veteran's paperwork may be. Because there are benefits to, you know, the veterans that, that they're available, uh, that are, are available to them, uh, that is a much easier thing to do if paperwork is available. 
Um, some folks don't want anything to do with it. They're, they didn't have a great experience and they're like, well, I did my time, but I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want my, my life to be dictated or remembered as a veteran. I'd rather it be for this. And that's fine. Uh, but we want to make sure we can gather those informa that information. And for those who may be a little bit confused about where to find a social security number, if you don't know for a, for a family member, tax returns are the best place to get. If you can't find the card, it's always on a tax return. Great. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thinking about uh, that and social security is something else I think people often ask about because they might, those might be uh, payments that are going to keep coming until you give the government an alert. Absolutely. And what happens uh, with that read is that we notify social security and there's about an eight week lag time for the most part. And what that means is that, you know, husband and wife situation, the spouse, whomever the surviving spouse is, may or may not be entitled to a higher payment. So, you know, it depends on who passed. So, for example, if, if let's say I lost my wife and she was the higher earner as far as income, then I will ultimately receive her Social Security benefit if it's higher than my own. Um, same goes if it's the opposite way around. If the husband's the, the wage earner, then, of course, the wife would receive the higher amount. The problem with that is that in that eight week time period, Social Security will get an automatic notification, but it takes them time to reverse course. So you may get a payment or two deposited into your account, and ultimately that'll be taken out or it'll be adjusted or what have you. You know it's done, you know it's processed when you see a $255 death benefit in there. That is the death benefit that has been the one for gosh, it's 50 plus years now. Um, a lot of money then, not a whole lot now, but still good, good trigger to look for to know that Social Security has processed. Medicare is connected to Social Security. That can be upwards of six months. So let's go back to that, you know, slow down a little bit. The, a lot of folks pay a Part B, Part D, whatever it may be titled. You don't want to rush off and cancel that for the person that passed away until you talk to them and ensure that they're aware. And, and the by them, you mean the, by them, you mean Medicare, Medicare. Yeah. So Medicare will Social Security will wrap up their business with a family and Medicare will be plugging along as if nothing ever happened. It can take upwards of six months. What will happen is you may get a medical bill that's not covered for whatever reason. You don't want to pay those things. You want to have let them know that Medicare is working on this. They, the death has occurred. Social Security is aware. Medicare will follow. They are responsible for payment up through your date of death. So any medical bills that you had that were Medicare approved, they will ultimately pay. So again, it's not just in a way... <laughs> taking a breath right at the beginning, but that's very important, but kind of getting used to taking a breath over and over again over the next few months as you try to work through these things, because you get these notices, obviously from banks and others that act like you must urgently respond to oh, whatever it is. Yeah, you don't need to. Uh, they, they want you to, but your bank is one that you certainly don't want to. You don't want to call your bank until um, you absolutely have a certified copy of a death certificate in hand because they can freeze half the account or in the case where you are um, a family member but not a spouse and you're not on the account, they can freeze the entire account so you can prove the death. So be careful uh, because some people have automatic payments. They rely on those accounts to be active and they may not be uh, because of that notification to the bank. They have to default to the law especially now. So uh, they're going to do what they feel is best in your interest and their own. So we, I mean, there is, as, as long as you deliberately move forward, you really, there is no rush to try to do uh, anything. You don't have to try to settle the accounts in the first month or two. You can take your oh, time. No. and No, no, you've got. And that's, you've got I mean, that's a, to somebody who is sort of, confronted at the moment of death i'm sure that lots of these things are in their head it's like oh i've got to do all this stuff right now right right yeah you want to be careful about some of your moves you you, you want to talk to your lawyer talk to your financial planner 
make sure that they're aware of what has happened. If there's trust and will set up, you want to make sure that those go into play, that your financial planner is aware of what's going on and what things may transfer to you. Um, you want to make sure you've got your death certificates in hand. And that's one of the real priorities that we work on is getting those certified copies to families quickly because you need them. They are the keys to all things legal. So you have to have those in hand and ready to go at all times. Um, beyond that, you want to talk to your professionals because they are the ones that are going to walk you through this process and they're going to avoid the tax benefit, the tax loopholes and things. The other thing is, let me just think for a second, I lost my train of thought there, but oh, a lot of folks are quick to want to change the title of their house. You have a mortgage outstanding on your home and you change the, the mortgage or you change the title, you very well are going to trigger two things. You may have to refinance, which is a much higher rate today. You may trigger unknowing, unknowingly tax burdens that could come up on real estate taxes, that maybe the house has been reassessed. Uh, lots of things like that and you have to be careful of. So not all things have to be done right away you've got time you actually with a house you can you can leave that be for a while so long as you can make the payments on it you're okay that's good yeah that's good to know um and uh i don't know whether this is something that you can generalize about but um um if if i were to ask you what people often wish they had thought about or talked about beforehand um do you get some common things that come up? You know, it's always the what did the, what did mom and dad want or the what did our loved one want? Husbands and wives are a little different. They tend to have that conversation more often. Children with their parents, very different story. And I can tell you, I'm a prime example. My father was a funeral director for 50 some years of his life and never told us what he wanted, ever. His answer to us was, your funeral directors figure it out. You'll know what to do. We had no idea what he wanted. Did he want a viewing? Did he not want a viewing? So we just kind of defaulted to doing it all because we figured, well, that's what he would want. So, um, yeah, have, that's the biggest thing. It's like, oh, did dad want a viewing? Did mom want a viewing? We never asked them that question. Did they want to be buried somewhere? Or did they want to be cremated? Or maybe a combination of the two? Uh, that's the kind of things that come up quite a bit mm -hmm. is what did they actually want? So, so trying to have that conversation. Yeah. So, trying to have yeah. that conversation, even if there's some reluctance is. Yeah. Just get an idea of a direction and then you can figure it out. You know, one of the big things with cremation, we're very cremation oriented society here. And um, one of the big things is, okay, yeah, mom wanted to be cremated. My next question normally will be, and what, what are your plans for the cremains after the cremation? Oh, we never thought about that. So now it's one of those things, you know. Um, so then we make a lot of suggestions. You can bury them. If the person's a veteran, they can be placed at the National Cemetery or what have you. Um, and it starts to get people thinking. A lot of celebrations of life come about from that conversation, which uh -huh. is wonderful. It's a great thing. Uh, as we should celebrate someone's life. It's more than, you know, it's not the, we don't go down the road. I mean, we're grieving, but the trend has been to celebrate versus have something very down and somber. So it's been, it's been a nice change. Yeah. And, yeah and, those are the thoughts. and the other thing that's changed to some degree, and we talked about this a couple of years ago when you participated in the uh, program we had here, we called it a fresh look at death, which were some of the other options that weren't present um, maybe uh, 10 years ago. You mentioned, oh, for yeah, example, green changed. burial now being. Yep. It's changed so much. Um, and we offer all the services now here. We've partnered with folks. Uh, so we offer the green burial. We're still the only funeral home cemetery that offers green burial on the peninsula. Uh, matter of fact, this morning I had a funeral home come in from Port Townsend for a green burial here at Hillcrest on the island. So um, we, we offer the aquamation, which is the alkaline hydrolysis. That is something that we've been actually with cremation families uh, providing or presenting both giving them the option to choose. Do you want the eco-friendly version, which is flameless, or do you want the traditional version, which is with flame? And then of course the uh, compost. So composting is a lot slower to catch on. 
What what does uh, 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 yeah, Sheila, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. What, what what is entailed with uh, the green burial and how much does that cost, Tim? So green burial is done without a casket, without a vault. It doesn't have to be without a casket, but most people choose to do it without. Uh, no vault, no embalming. Person is bathed and wrapped in a linen shroud and placed directly into the earth. And so you purchase a grave and have the grave opened and we provide all the services. So to give you an idea, a, a full green burial with grave purchase, opening and closing of the grave, which is digging the grave and then filling it. Uh, all the services of preparing the person, the administrative, the transportation, everything runs about $5,200 complete. About half the cost of a traditional funeral. Traditional funerals are eight, 10, 12,000 now. How, how about uh, for just cremation? Cremation, you're about 2,000. At 2,000? Yes, ma'am, yeah. $2,000, $2,100 right around there. It depends what you do. You can add services to cremation and go higher. Uh, or you can stay right in that $2,000 range. Uh, some people will upgrade and earn or get something nicer. So it all adds money to it. Death certificates add to it. Um, and then you have the the aquamation, which is the blameless. Yeah. That's what about is that $2, one? $600. $600. Oh, I'm sorry. What is that one? That one is done, it's done through an alkaline solution. So you are placed into a chamber and it fills with a warm alkaline solution and then it gently moves back and forth to keep the solution moving. And rather than fire, it actually dissolves everything and then leaves behind this, the same uh, as the cremation, which is the skeletal material. The difference is, and a great way to describe the two, somebody actually described it to me, a family did, Cremation gives you the consistency of our sand on our beaches here, that kind of granulated consistency. And aquamation gives you what would be comparable to uh, confectioner's sugar. It's very soft, very powdered. It's unique. And, uh, and so, you say that that's uh, more ecologically sound? It is, because there's no carbon releases, because you're not using any fuel. Uh, and then the alkaline solution goes off into our, our wastewater system, which helps with the chemical loads because it's obviously alkaline going into an acidic environment. And then what's left, you get about 20% more of the remains back because there's no open flue or chamber uh, as you would have in, a, in any type of a fire-based uh, equipment where you have to, you know, you have to ventilate the flue, the, the, the chimney stack. So you don't lose the remains to that so everything is maintained in this sealed chamber uh, so it works out really nicely actually and i think we cut you off when sheila was asking what the cost generally range is there so cremation is about twenty one hundred dollars for round numbers aquamation is about twenty six hundred dollars so very Green simple. burial is about 52 and composting ranges we we offered it 5500 and it can go up into the 7,000 range, depending on the company. I'm not sure what the why the, that big difference, but there is a pretty substantial difference in the companies. And with composting, we, you end up with uh, um, an effort to, uh, often there's probably a burial or whatever you might call that, the dispersion of the, of, of the remains. Right. So you end up with a cubic yard of material. So that's a lot of material. That's a small dump truck. one. So about 19 wheelbarrows. Um, so you have to figure out what you're going to do with it. Uh, some of it can go in your garden, uh, and a lot of it goes out onto public or not public, but private lands that are owned by these companies. So yes, those are those are a lot of things that weren't uh, part of the business when you uh, started to work with your dad. It sounds like oh, not at all. Yeah, we were. You had two options, and it was mainly burial. I was just having that discussion today. It was interesting. You know, we had flower cars and limousines and all kinds of things. You know, it was all the pomp and circumstance when I started. And now, uh, very different. And cremation was just an occasional thing that happened. Um, that really changed. It actually really caught on when the Catholic Church decided cremation was acceptable in their faith. And that's when you started to see that build up because that was one of the big kickers was the churches weren't completely sold on cremation. 
Uh, but now, now that they've changed, and they were like one of the first ones to come out and publicly say, yep, yeah, we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you started to see people take notice. And now it's, it's very commonplace. Well, I really want to thank you for taking time and, and sharing oh, these. I, I, I think that I think these are, you know, the the idea of the fact that there's no rush, the idea that uh, that there are people who can help you and some um, clarity about what some of the options are when you go to talk to somebody like you, Tim, at Cook Family Funeral Home. Uh, we'll put a lot of people's minds at rest. So I really appreciate you taking the, the time today to. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I'll leave this with anybody who wants. Uh, we have some planning guides available to you that are free. Uh, if you if you want one mailed out or stop by and pick one up, it's a great way. If you do nothing but fill it out, stick it in a drawer for your family, you're ahead of most people. So we're glad to have them here for you. But okay, Bree, thanks for everything you do. You guys do a great job at that senior center. 